Good afternoon and welcome to Faskin's 13th consecutive mining series. My name is Frank Mariage. I'm part of the Faskin Global Mining Group, and I'm also a partner from Faskin's Montreal office. Today's webinar, Trends in M&A, Lessons for Mining Companies, is the second in our series of nine seminars this year. A calendar of all Faskin's PDAC events can be found underneath the video window. Please refer to the slide on your screen for some housekeeping items. Now, I turn it over to my colleague, Florin Polo, the moderator for our session, who will introduce today's panel. Over to you, Florin. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, my name is Florin Polo. As Frank noted, I'm a partner in Faskin's Toronto office. Uh, I practice mainly the m and uh, some corporate finance and shareholder activism space. Um, I understand there is a lot of interest on this session, so we're all very excited uh, to be with you today, uh, virtually. Uh, I'm joined today by my uh, panelists, uh, leading individuals really in their fields um, in Canada and, and internationally. Um, Brad Freeland, uh, partner in Toronto, Sarah Gingrich, uh, our co-leader uh, of Faskins Capital Markets and m and Group, uh, and Neil Kravitz in our Montreal office. Uh, co-leader of Faskin's cross-border and international practice. So uh, we've divided the session in a number of themes, but before we get to that today, uh, I'd like uh, each of the panelists to just introduce themselves and a little bit about their practice. I can I can go first. Thanks, uh, Florin. Um, it's going to sound like I'm copying you, but but I'm a partner in the Toronto office with a practice focused on M and A. Uh, shareholder activism and, and corporate finance. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, in the mining space, uh, especially in the public M&A uh, sector. So uh, really happy to, to be here and see on this panel with, uh, with my partners. Excellent. Neil? My name oh, sorry, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Neil. After you. All right. Uh, my name is Sarah Gingrich. Uh, thanks, Flo, for the introduction. I'm a partner in our Calgary office, though I practice pretty much nationally um, and work uh, with, in particular, our Vancouver, Montreal and Toronto offices quite frequently. My practice is focused, like everyone else's, um, on capital markets and mergers and acquisitions. I do a lot of work in the mining space, but of course, being in Calgary, I also do a fair bit in the energy space as well. I co-lead our group here uh, locally, um, and I also am the co-leader of our group nationally. Over to Neil. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Neil Kravitz, I'm a partner in the Montreal office. And as uh, Flo mentioned, I co-lead our uh, cross-border and international practice, uh, do M&A uh, and corporate finance, governance and activism work as well. And um, happy to be included in today's panel. Excellent. Uh, thank you all. So as I mentioned earlier, we've divided the discussion today in a number of themes, uh, the first one being capital raising and M&A. Um, so why don't we just get right to it? Um, so the first question, I suppose I'll direct it to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, what are some trends that you're seeing in the mining space in the past year? Uh, and has it become difficult to raise capital uh, in the current environment? I think the biggest trend we're seeing is that most people have uh, little consensus on the economic outlet um, of the industry or how the market's going to respond in 2023. The concerns we're seeing from our mining players are higher energy costs, shifting supply chains, climate related regulation and activism. These aren't surprising concerns as you know many other industries are focused on them as well. But even with the high degree of uncertainty globally and within the industry specifically, uh, Q3 and Q4 of 2022 saw the largest amount of M&A activity in a decade. 2023 is a question mark at this time, but we're seeing a lot of activity. Mining companies are continuing to make acquisitions and investments, knowing that regardless of the instability that we're seeing today, um, the demands of the energy transition and the risk of supply deficits are significant. We're also seeing a high demand in areas linked to electric vehicle supply chain, uh, copper, lithium, battery minerals, and base minerals seem to be areas of growth and also potential consolidation. To your second question, it's definitely harder to raise capital at this time. Last year, the IPO market completely fell. Um, the market's been unstable. Investors are wary. Costs are high. 
We've seen a number of deals get started and stop and start again and put on hold. Um, and the uncertainty, obviously, of the global market and the geopolitical conditions has companies quite concerned. Excellent. And and I, and I guess one other thing that we're seeing is that we're, we're seeing a lot of activity from uh, the bidders as well as the targets um, really all over uh, the world, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, China, so multi-jurisdictional, which, which goes exactly to your point in terms of the uptick in activity. Um, uh, so, and, and maybe, uh, you know, we dive a little bit deeper into the current environment, uh, knowing, you know, the, the current interest rates being being at, at a, quite high. Um, so, so, Brad, uh, let me direct this question to you. Uh, so, in light of the current interest rates that we're seeing, uh, have you noticed any changes in the types of financings uh, that are being announced and completed now? Yeah, so it, it it it's an interesting um, time uh, flow, and uh, we've had the opportunity to work on a few deals together already this year. It seemed, I mean, there's no there's no doubt that 2022 was a tough year uh, in the equity markets um, and in the mining space in particular. There seemed to be this window that opened up about mid January. Um, I think that was you know a function of gold price was uh, increasing rapidly when it seemed that. Um, uh, rate cuts were actually on the horizon. And so gold price was up and, and some financings got announced. Those were, those were typical financings, um, uh, com, you know, prospectus offering common shares. So no, no new structuring there. But then we saw, uh, then we were involved in a deal that was actually a convertible debenture deal. Um, and, and it had an 8% coupon. Uh, obviously tied to the current interest rate environment. And, you know, we heard from, we we're on for the dealers, we heard from the dealers that they expected or expect there to be more uh, of these convertible debenture offerings out there, which, which have been relatively rare uh, in a low interest rate environment. But now, you know, with a high coupon rate, they, they can be attractive uh, and you still, still have the equity upside, uh, especially if the conversion price is sort of priced uh, accordingly. So that you know, that's an interesting development. We'll see if that um, if that turns into a trend. Yeah, so, I would I would add to that. Uh, what we're seeing is people, companies who need capital, are being maybe a little bit more cautious. Um, there are windows, as Brad alluded to, where you know people who can set up the financings for them are you know uh, indicating what the windows might be. But um, unless you kind of need capital, you, you don't want to be the one taking the you know call it stupid money. So uh, people are being cautious about how they do their financings and thinking about uh, the timing and whether they really need to go to market now or they can wait for a more stable environment. So seeing people kind of being more thoughtful about it and maybe taking a little more time before they, they jump into a deal, obviously depending on how badly they need the capital and how immediately they need the capital. Oh, that, that, that's excellent, Neil. And, and it's a good segue because with, you know, with the current inflation and and that translates to essentially rising costs um and it impacts the operations of companies um are you seeing a little bit more consolidation in the industry uh in order to capitalize on this cost synergies a uh, short answer i guess would be yes people are i think that's where people's uh heads are, are at uh, this industry tends to have maybe a little bit more you know in the sense of when transactions are done, it's often mergers, you know, not necessarily a takeout um, as opposed to some other industries. But I think uh, the current economic environment is probably pushing people to, to think that way a little bit more. I don't know if others have comments on that front. Yeah, well, look, this sort of created this transaction, the Agnico Kirkland Lake uh, transaction is a, a good example of um you know, two large companies coming together in an MOE, an emergency equals deal uh, with significant cost synergies. Now that transaction predated the, the whole, you know, increase in rates and, and rising costs. So it isn't directly on point, um, but, it, but it is a good example of, of companies seeking cost synergies. I, ha I have found though that, you know, it, it costs synergies in, you know, in the mining industry, you know, they're, they're certainly a, a nice goal to have, but sometimes they're more, it's, it's difficult to realize, right? There's obviously 
corporate GNA synergies that can be had in, in, in any, any merger really, but it's operational synergies that may be difficult to uh, achieve if the, you know, if the two companies don't have projects that are uh, located nearby each other. No, no, that's that's absolutely right, uh, Brad. And we've seen, um, you know, with, with a number of players where there is sort of M and A activity uh, because they have various projects uh, in in common jurisdictions with one another, and and so it makes sense, you know, to continue operations in those jurisdictions and and consolidate, so so you have a, a bigger footprint, really. Um, and I think it's the footprint too, but sometimes with the supply chain issues that we're seeing and also the labor shortages that we're seeing too, you know, that adds to synergistic relationships that can happen if they, if they work from a cost perspective, the other piece is a, is a high level consideration as well. And, and we are seeing that with our clients talking about, you know, I've got a better supply chain here, or we don't have a labor issue and you do and that kind of thing. And, and that sort of is leading to the dialogue we're seeing as well. Excellent. And, and, and so I, I guess you've touched a little bit upon this, Sarah, but, um, you, you know, uh, you know, supply chain being one of the factors, but, you know, stepping back a little bit, what are some of the driving factors that are making mining companies transact with one another in the last two years? Um, I mean, I think the players in the industry are in a stronger financial position overall because COVID brought with it increased financial discipline, uh, cost control. They've been careful with capital and discretionary spending, and there hasn't been as much acquisition activity overall in the last little bit. Um, we're seeing increased capex costs for the entire sector. And so, you know, all of the things we've just mentioned are resulting in people looking for ways to create shareholder value. Uh, to transact, to, um, you know, generate better synergies. We're seeing larger companies sitting back and kind of watching um, those who have cash. They, they have the, the benefit of that. Um, we're also seeing larger companies looking to junior miners to develop projects and then engage in M&A activity on those projects so they don't have to go into the spend. Uh, with the junior miners, we're definitely seeing an appetite for consolidation, um, you know, to maximize on the synergies we already talked about, uh, joint ventures, exploring alternative financing arrangements to pursue growth more aggressively. And since companies have struggled to finance via the capital markets, in particularly in 22, um, 2022, we're seeing companies turning to joint ventures, direct financing and long term offtake agreements to secure supply. So these are some of the things that are, you know, the industry shifting ever so slightly from, you know, the aggressive highs of 2021 when it was just, you know, raise money, uh, buy, sell, that kind of thing. People are just being more careful generally right now. Sarah, that's an interesting point because some of these transactions are financings. I wouldn't say disguised as transactions, but in lieu of a financing because people have are having trouble getting access to capital. So you might that might be a driving force is, is just, you know, you don't have capital and there's a partner out there who might you know have capital sitting there so um it might be an alternative to a straightforward financing simply because you know can't get it done in the current environment i don't know if you're, exactly. you're experiencing that as well but uh certainly whether it's mining or other industries uh, we've been seeing that as well well i think i mean i think that sort of describes uh you know the age-old major junior uh, uh dynamic right and if, if juniors are having difficulty uh, raising their own capital and, and you know are struggling to advance their projects, then it may be maybe that they have to sell earlier to the major. And at the same time, you know, majors are are constantly looking to replenish their you know depleting reserve, uh, reserves. So I think we've seen a lot of transactions uh, uh, like that occur over the last couple of years, and I I expect there to be uh, many more uh, along this, the same nature. I mean, I think the other thing that we've heard is, um, you know, there there was, uh, you know, a bit of a flight, uh, you know, on the buy side, um, you know, less coverage uh, in the mining sector when when gold prices in particular were struggling, sort of like 2018 or or before, and hasn't really come back as uh, to to full to full strength, and so now there's this you know real focus on. Uh, companies getting bigger to attract more generalist funds um, in order to, you know, be able to raise capital and, and you know, have increased liquidity and, and all that stuff. So they're, it's not getting bigger necessarily for bigger sake, but but being bigger and having economies of scale 
is definitely part of the equation now. No, and that's that's a good point, Brad. And and the exposure that gives you with this funds, uh, it it by very nature uh, gives you a lot more access to capital. Um, and 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 so absolutely. Um, so why don't we switch gears a little bit now? And and what you know, uh, why don't we get to the nuts and bolts of deal protection and, and deal certainty? And I don't think I've ever negotiated uh, a deal, certainly not a public M and A deal, where uh, deal protection and deal certainty were not at the forefront uh, between both parties. Uh, so Neil, uh, let me ask you, and, and and I apologize, it is a loaded question, but what are some of the most uh, common uh, deal protection and deal certainty measures uh, that you know companies uh, put in their agreements? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not just saying this because we're partners, but you're 100%, right? So a lot of the discussion and negotiation tends to be around deal protection, unless there's a particular um issue a commercial issue or regulatory issue you know there's, there's a whole menu of them and and depends what side you're on uh, and some are the corollary of others so i mean if you're on the acquirer side uh, you know there's no better deal protection than having the highest price that you think could be put in the market so uh, cash is king having a, a topping price is always is always good um you have lockups with um significant shareholders and there's a whole range of those from lockups where the shareholder can get out if another party comes along and offers anything more to a hard lockup where they just cannot get out to you know for an X period of time, and that can even include and in, you know you don't see this often, but a right of first refusal you know on any sale of shares by uh, by a shareholder for a period of time, uh, non solicitation, uh, no shop provisions. If you're an acquirer, you're going to have, you know, typically a right to match. So, if somebody else comes along and tries to um, beat your offer, you'll have, uh, you know, a specified number of days to match that. Um, a force the vote provision, where, you know, even in circumstances where somebody else comes along, if it's a plan of arrangement or an amalgamation where the shareholders are voting for approval, that you can force the vote, you know, no matter what is going on. Uh, obviously, termination and break fees. Uh, figure in as well. And there's obviously, you know, there's a band with which you can work uh, because there, um, you know, there there are certain things in the industry where either in the industry or M and A in general where there's an acceptable kind of range of break fees. And then if, if you're on the other side, if you're on the target side, you're talking about reverse break fees. So the acquirer, you know, is going to walk away. Um, is there a fee that they're going to pay? Um, you know, a go shop provision uh, that's more to protect your fiduciary duties. Uh, a fiduciary out, so if somebody else does come along with a higher price, you're able to go uh, and do a deal with that party. Um, on the regulatory side, you'll also see some deal protection. So on one side, if you're the acquirer, you might want to have what's called a hell or high water clause, which means that the target has to do anything and everything to get regulatory approval. So if you're talking about competition law approval, that means if the Competition Bureau says, we want you to divest of this asset, you have to do it. So it's called hell or high water because, you know, come hell or high water, you have to do whatever is needed to get the deal done. And then if you're on the target side, on the other side, you might want to have the opposite, which is, you know, we don't have to do anything. So we want to, we don't have to do something that might uh, be, you know, harmful to our business or something that we won't, don't want to do just because a regulator says so. That's not necessarily on the deal protection, but it's kind of the mirror image of the uh, hell or high water clause. Excellent. And and just just to just uh, query a little bit, Neil, when you mentioned the lockups, uh, is it often that is the directors and officers of companies that enter into these lockups, or do you often see significant shareholders as well, or can they? Yeah, you can definitely see you can, and you will often see significant shareholders. I mean, certainly if you're the acquirer, you want as much locked up as possible. Uh, officers and directors. If we're talking about non-significant shareholders, officers and directors. You almost take it as a given that there's you know going to be at least some form of lockup, probably what I would call a normal lockup, which means that if the main transaction dies, the shareholder gets out of the lockup. Uh, but certainly one of the things you want to think about um, from a strategic perspective in your acquirer is you know what's who's holding, what's the capital like, what's the cap table like, who can I lock up, who's going to be friendly to the transaction? Because it's always best to go to the market and say, you know, they're already, you know. 40% or more of the transaction 
that's locked up in Canada. You see it quite often because um, we tend to have companies that are more closely held than our neighbors in the United States, for example. Uh, we have family controlled companies. Uh, a lot of our companies, leading companies, are family controlled or have, you know, otherwise have the founders who have a, a significant piece. And then we do have a lot of multiple and subordinate uh, structures as well. So something you definitely you definitely see very often, unless it's a really kind of widely held, more fragmented shareholding base. Yeah, I think just maybe just to add to that, um, you know, I think what we don't see is institutional shareholders That's a good uh, point. willing to enter into to any form of lockup or voting support agreement. So, you know, if, if there's a significant shareholder that is, you know, a founder or you know, family control, then then I think it would be quite quite common to to insist that they you're required that they enter into a lockup, but it's hard, really hard to to get the institutions um, to to sign up to those. Here's here I'm going to throw this out there, and I, we didn't pre-plan this, so I, I'm not sure how well this is going to work. But in terms of voting support agreements in arrangements, right, we talk about hard versus soft lockups. We're really, I think, when we're talking about that, we're really talking about in the context of a takeover bid, right? And so a hard lockup and a takeover bid would be an irrevocable agreement by the shareholder to tender. And a soft would allow them to uh, to not tender if a, if a better bid came around. In an arrangement concept though, or context, uh, you know, I guess I've only seen voting support agreements that as, as Neil said, uh, uh, they're hard in the sense that the shareholder can't get out of them. Uh, out of their out of its own volition, but they do fall away if the arrangement agreement is terminated. So, in effect, the board the board has the right. The board of the target has the right as a fiduciary out, and then the, then the voting agreement would fall away. But has anybody ever seen or played around with the idea of making a hard voting support agreement where, and I'm making this up, where the shareholder may not to be able to vote in favor or tender to another deal for some period of time after the transaction. Yeah, I've seen it in uh, a couple of situations. Um, I've seen it in a merger of equals situation where it's a family controlled public company uh, and essentially the controlling family wants to make it clear to the board that they you know, were not willing to do any other type of deal. So you'll have the agreement uh, say, that not only can they not um, you know, sell their shares to somebody else for X period, they cannot vote in favor of another transaction. You know, um, there is some some case law out there in terms of uh, you know, how binding that might be because you have the agreement versus the corporate law right to, to vote your shares. So you have to deal with that if it ever came to it. But it's certainly a powerful message to the market that that controlling shareholder is you know, fundamentally tied to this deal and um, you know, I've had situations where another deal came along at, in that scenario and they appealed to the controlling shareholder. It's just all, you know, it was public domain by years ago. Um, and that shareholder wrote to the board saying, you know, not only am I bound by an agreement, I, I have no interest in doing any other transaction. So I'm certainly not saying it's common. I, I don't think it is, but uh, I've seen it done on some occasions. Uh, I don't know if others have. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I was going to add to that. I've seen it in one instance as well, where there was a controlling shareholder. And the idea was that it was a hard lockout because even if the transaction, the arrangement was to fall away, that there is a topping bid, uh, the acquirer, the, 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 you know, the previous acquirer could still proceed with an alternative transaction, such as a takeover. And, the, you know, these controlling shareholders had, uh, had pledged that they were going to vote their shares in favor. Uh, it's an alternative transaction. So, um, so yeah. So, I, so I mean, l like both of you said, not not common, but but there's always, uh, I suppose, very innovative ways. Yeah, I've, I've <laughs> learned something on this panel. It's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, why don't we? And, and Neil touched a little bit on this on on force the vote. So, so Brad, let me ask you this. So, what what is a force the vote provision? H how are they? Uh, you know, structured in an agreement. And, uh, you know, many people may be confused. When are they actually, because it seems like a pretty drastic measure. When are they actually beneficial? 
Yeah. So we're really getting into the weeds now, um, which is which is okay. So you know, in the, in the normal context, in, in an arrangement agreement, as we talked about, the target board has you know what's called a fiduciary out, and and the fidu- they can exercise this fiduciary out if a uh, acquisition proposal, like a competing bid, um, comes along that they determine is superior. Um, you know, and the acquirer doesn't match. Uh, um, a force the vote provision is uh, is purchaser friendly in the sense that it's it's it doesn't allow the target to actually terminate the arrangement agreement in the face of a superior proposal, uh, and instead the target is forced to hold. You know, if the purchaser. Uh, wants is f- the target is forced to hold its meeting, and effectively what that means is the the target shareholders are going to decide whether or not this competing transaction uh, is in fact superior and and which which transaction they wish to pursue. So now the board, the target board, isn't going to be prohibited from changing its recommendation. Uh, but they would be prohibited from terminating, uh, as I said. Now, when are force the votes used? Uh, typically in, in a merger of equals context or like a no premium or low premium transaction. I think, you know, there was one used in the potash agrium deal, uh, you know, several years back. And then uh, there was one we were on for Kirkland Lake in that in the Agnico transaction that I mentioned earlier. There was a force the vote provision uh, in that transaction, and the and the idea is, you know, it you're comparing you'd be comparing apples to oranges if you have a premium deal come along, uh, you know, a, a topping bid made for the target at a premium, and against this merger of equals transaction because they're very they're very different deals, and. You know, the board may decide that actually it thinks it's in the best interest of the corporation and its shareholders to take the the premium, but that might be more short term than long term. And shareholders may say, you know what, actually we we would prefer to uh, to have the MOE transaction continue and benefit from a, a re rating of the shares after the fact. So I think I think it's a function of. You know, if you, you know, if you're an acquirer, uh, you know, and a, and a target in a putting forward a, a no premium or low premium transaction, you you know, as the acquirer, you may want the ability to force the target to continue towards its shareholder mean to give shareholders a real say. Yeah, and just to maybe get ourselves out of the weeds a, a little bit, you know, it's a, no, it's a, it's a perfect explanation of force the vote, but just so everyone understands. You know, the menu of, of uh, deal protection that we just discussed kind of ranges from light to heavy, and you're going to take somewhat of a balanced approach. So you're not going to have a hard lockup with, um, you know, a, a regulatory hell or high water with a, you know, highest range termination fee and, and a force of the vote. You got to pick your battles, so to speak, and you have to put a deal in the market that makes sense. You don't want to, you know, look like you're forcing a, a deal down the shareholder's throat. So you're going to pick and choose that menu based on the circumstances. And of course, the vote might make perfect sense in the scenario that that uh, Brad just described, but um, you might put it in another deal and say, well, you know, that doesn't make sense that that's there given the, the circumstances and the other deal protection measures. So you, you want to think about it in a holistic way. Yeah, and and I just want to make sure people understand it's you know having a force the vote is purchaser friendly. It is deal protection for the purchaser, but it but it's it's not a silver bullet to prevent interlopers. Um, you know, case in point would be the the Goldfields Uana transaction. We were we were on for Goldfields. We had a force the vote provision in the agreement, um, but you know Pan American Agnico came along w- with a with an offer that. Um, Humana deemed to be a superior proposal. We could have forced the vote, uh, you know, but for for you know various reasons, chose not to, and you know walked away with our our break fee. Um, so it wasn't as though the forced the vote it, you're necessarily going to exercise it, and if you did, it, you're necessarily going to succeed. So it's I think it's I think it is a nice to have 
for a purchaser. But it, but it, but I don't think anybody should, um, you know, form the view that it guarantee, you know, it, it is anything close to a guarantee that your deal is going to uh, be completed if you have a force vote. So, and 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 I appreciate uh, that's an excellent example. And, and Neil, I totally agree in terms of the spectrum. And and without running the risk of of self marketing here, uh, I, I I think that's where it comes down to having very experienced counsel in this type of transactions and finding the right balance, right? Because you still want you know sufficient protections, but you still want to get the deal done ultimately uh, as the goal of the party. So absolutely. So so Brad, you mentioned uh, fees and, and I, it's a perfect segue because this is exactly what uh, you know I, I wanted to touch upon next. And, and uh, so perhaps uh, Sarah, you know, I can direct this question to you. So uh, often we see in agreements that that companies um, essentially set break fees as a, as a you know price to exit. Um, in permitted circumstances. Um, and we've seen it all ranging in all dollar values, uh, sometimes in agreements running hundreds of millions, depending on the deal size. How is a quantum actually determined? What's the science behind it, if there is one? <laughs> I don't know that there necessarily is a science. I mean, you know, to, to go kind of high level first, I mean, obviously both sides are typically looking to um, offset deal risk. Uh, both sides are looking for deal certainty, protection against lots time and financial resources. And so they put a break fee in um, that both directly and indirectly, um, you know, does that. Directly, it compensates a buyer for a failure to close. And indirectly, it serves to discourage a target from pursuing alternative transactions, which aren't materially better. So when we're negotiating a break fee, we obviously have to consider a number of factors. Um, one of them is the size of the fee relative to the size of the transaction. You have to look at the size of the fee as compared to other similar transactions. And you're also looking at the industry and the location of the target. And it's really a matter of negotiation. The range for break fees typically runs from about 2 to 4.5% of the equity or enterprise value. Um, right now we're seeing kind of three to 3.5%, but with that said, the range can be much greater, um, especially in the case of a very large transaction, you know, you can see as low as below 1% or as high as 13, 14%, which are obviously outliers. Outsized break fees, such as that 13% I just meant, uh, mentioned can generate increased regulatory scrutiny. So each of Ontario, BC and Alberta securities commissions have clearly stated that the size of a break fee may result in it constituting an improper defensive tactic. So, you know, going back to what Neil and Brad were talking about is anything that you put in, you know, could attract scrutiny and could be used against you, so to speak. So we have to be careful when we're putting in all these different deal protections. Um, financial and legal advisors can provide lists of comparables for transaction size um, and specific industry. And then when you're doing your comparisons, one thing to keep in mind is, Make sure that your denominators are consistent. So are you looking at equity value or enterprise value? Are they calculated on a similar basis? And also where shares are being used as consideration, it has to be important to consider how the shares are valued. Excellent. And, and I think the point about the regulatory scrutiny is also a good one, Sarah. I'm very glad you touched upon that because um, you know we, we've often seen you know companies being a little bit shy of setting the break fees too high. Uh, because you don't want to come across as being too coercive. Um, so, so, so absolutely. Um, and and so on that point, then, uh, and and Brad, perhaps this is a question for you: Is uh, you know when uh, you know when does an acquirer, uh, in what circumstances would they receive a break fee? Number one, and and often people think that well, if the target shareholders vote a deal down. Uh, the acquirer gets a break fee. Could you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah. So, look, the the you know the 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 most uh, common you know circumstance where an acquirer would be entitled to a break fee is uh, if the if the target uh, has determined that a competing bid is a superior proposal and is terminating the existing arrangement agreement. That that would entitle the acquirer uh, to a break fee. Um, you know, other other circumstances uh, that are common would be, you know, if the target was, you know, immaterial or willful breach of its non-solicitation provisions, that that might 
uh, that is obviously designed to dis to discourage the target from breaching those provisions because uh, you know they may be subject to damages for willful breach uh, in, in on on top of the break fee depending on how the the clause is drafted. But they'll know that at a minimum they'd be subject to the break fee, uh, which could be you know quite a severe penalty. So there's that that's just really putting some teeth uh, to those uh, provisions. You know, a third a third case, um, and this is diving into the weeds again a little bit, is the you know what's commonly known as the tail provision. And so, in that circumstance, um, you have a situation where a competing bid is made uh, for the target, uh, publicly made, uh, but the target determines that it's not a superior proposal and proceeds uh, towards its shareholder meeting. At the shareholder meeting, the, sh the target shareholders vote the transaction down. Now, if uh, if after the the you know the existing arrangement is is terminated because it needed shareholder approval, uh, the target ends up transacting with the competing bidder, or in some circumstances with another bidder, uh, that may trigger uh, a break fee as well. So that's that's the tail provision. So those those are sort of the common circumstances. I I would say that the idea um, of a break fee being payable on what you know what is commonly called like a naked no vote, right, where the shareholders vote the transaction down in the absence of a competing bid, is very rare because um, that you know could be perceived as coercive towards the target shareholders. So I I, I think that's I don't know whether that's enforceable or not. I'm not sure there's case law on that. But I, you know, as a, if you were on for the target, you would you would just simply refuse to accept that. I think in lieu of a break fee, you know, if if the acquirer is looking for compensation in the event that the target shareholders are, uh, vote the transaction down, it would be far more customary uh, for there to be an expense reimbursement um, triggered at at a you know, some, again, some percentage or some flat fee, but it would be much smaller than the the break fee quantum. Mm -hmm. And for expense reimbursement, Brad, like, do you have to, uh, I guess, still document whatever the expenses were that you get reimbursed? Or is it more sort of like a break fee, like a, a price to uh, presumably, uh, you know, sort of like a liquidated damages concept? Yeah, I, I I think I've seen both, right? Sometimes it's reasonable, you know, documented expenses up to a certain amount. There's there's always a cap. It's not going to be open ended, and and sometimes it would just be sort of a flat fee uh, that represents the you know the the, the party's expenses. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, and and so I guess uh, you know, and and what you know to end off this sort of uh, themes is. Um, from the acquirer's perspective, uh, you're always worried about interlopers, right? You signed a deal, you announced it, everyone is happy, um, and um, the target has certain uh, no shop provisions. Um, but uh, often we see interlopers coming along. Uh, and so, uh, Neil, why don't I direct this to you? What are some of the ways um, in which you want to minimize? Uh, interloper risk. Uh, what can you do in, in agreements? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think there are different categories and depends on your circumstances. Some of the things you can do in agreements and some things is not, you know, necessarily just the agreement. So one of the things you could do is um, act with act with speed. So there's an old expression, uh, you know, time is, is not the friend of a deal. So uh, if you don't want else, someone else to come along, act as quickly as you can. And you always get the timelines at the beginning of the transactions and um, depends you know what side you're acting for but you want to close as hold your meeting uh close as quickly as possible if it's a voted upon transaction sometimes you simply can't do that um if there's a regulatory approval that's needed whether it's competition act investment canada if it's a highly regulated industry whether um you know it's it's uh it might be something in mining or if you're doing a communications deal it's crtc as you can see the roger shaw transactions being held up in competition bureau and, and litigation for a long time. So um, sometimes you just can't act with speed, but if you can, that certainly helps. Um, 
you know, so that's one thing you could do. We talk about a lot of them in terms of deal protection um, to make it as difficult as possible, frankly, for an interloper to come. And that's a combination of, you know, the break fee, can you set it as high as you can? Um, you have a right to match if you're forcing the vote. Um, you know, those are various things. Certainly, if you have a lockup on a very significant shareholder and you have rights as to those shareholder shares, I have seen one or two circumstances in my career where uh, the acquirer actually had a right, an option to acquire the major shareholder shares for six months, even after termination of the deal. That's, you know, on the more extreme end. Um, you start thinking about it early on. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, one of the things is normally, even at the outset, um, when parties sign a non-disclosure agreement for a public deal, they'll often have a standstill, which means that the party who's the potential buyer or interested party um, says that they will not on their own, on an unfriendly basis, uh, go after the target or try to acquire its shares. Um, and that standstill usually has what's called a springing provision. So that means if somebody, if the target announces another deal or somebody else comes along, all bets are off. I have seen situations where um, there's no springing provision, which means that um, if a party signed a standstill, they're just bound by that standstill. And there's a covenant on the part of the target to enforce all existing stand standstills. That's more when the target wants to, I think from a strategic perspective, force all the potential buyers to put in their best possible price for the auction because they're told you're not getting a second kick at the can. I don't want to sound too much like a banker here as opposed to a lawyer, but uh, that does happen. So I think we talked about a lot of them, but um, you want to move with uh, you know speed if you can and then have as much locked up in the deal while still being a reasonable deal and not risking what Sarah you know, outlined as, as um, having trouble with your transaction from a regulatory perspective, or even institutional shareholders saying, you know what, we're not comfortable with the way you structured the transaction. Because the other thing I would say, I think this is a jump off from Sarah's point, it's not just the regulators. You have institutional shareholders uh, who are investing in a lot of these companies, and they want to you know, a fair transaction that's proper, properly priced, and they don't want, um, you know, to be coerced into a transaction so that, you know, they're perfectly happy if the market decides what the best price for the asset is, uh, oftentimes, depending on the circumstances. So you have to deal with those and the, and, the, and the target has to deal with their own shareholders as well and not look like they're trying to force something down someone's throat. So, um, you know, those factors all come into play. Here's an interesting situation that I had, um, sort of dealing with the the spring, uh, Neil, that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, I think from an acquirer's perspective, it's it's as you say, it's customary to have that covenant by the target not to waive any standstills uh, and to enforce any standstills. Of course, the problem is, uh, you know, in in the vast majority of cases, the the confidentiality agreements have the automatic spring. So the parties are released from, from the standstill obligation, notwithstanding that covenant. So I've seen some, you know, I've seen it on a deal before where the acquirer attempted to uh, negotiate uh, into the superior proposal definition. Uh, so a condition that the ac acquisition proposal, the competing bid, wasn't made from a party that was in the data room for some period of time prior to announcement, which which I thought was clever, but but wholly unacceptable. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you know, we, we luckily prevailed on that one, probably out of principle and market practice. But that was, I mean, that is a strong, that is a strong protection uh, or mechanism to to reduce interloper risk. You need to have a lot of leverage to to pull that off though. Excellent. So uh, I, I know we've touched on sort of the capital markets and M&A and, and the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, quite frankly, the most important thing, deal protection and deal certainty. Um, why don't we switch gears a little bit now for, for another theme, a, a third theme, uh, that being, and we've seen it being on the news as well in the last two, three years of transactions, uh, premium transactions versus at the market transactions. So, uh, uh, Sarah, let me direct, I, I suppose, the, the, the first discussion point to you. Um, so, 
we've seen a lot of this, you know, large change of control transactions and sometimes offered at no premium or very low premium, uh, often um, known as mergers of equals. Um, my question is, why would a target uh, ever agree to that? Well, I think it's a good question because a lot of people say, why would they ever agree? The market generally doesn't love mergers of equals unless the benefits are very, very obvious and one or both parties had no path to create you know, additional shareholder value. They're extremely challenging deals, not only to negotiate, um, but from a communications perspective, both internally because of the politics and involved and because nobody really believes they are true equals, but also you know, externally because of market perception. So you asked the question, why would why would a target agree? Um, frequently, it's strategic rationale. Um, the strategic rationale is significant and financial rationale is not customarily the only factor. Benefits of a merger of equals include things like increased market share, reduced competition, reduced expense, expenses, the creation of synergies that we mentioned at the outset, and expansion into additional markets in a really effective way. Sometimes you'll see a human capital element in terms of succession planning and expertise. You know, you'll have an older board or an older CEO and you're looking to leverage maybe a younger, a younger group. Um, in a merger of equals, the combined executive team and the board of directors are typically comprised of individuals from both legacy organizations. We also mentioned supply chain and, and labor shortages, and, and that can be affected in a merger of equals. To add, there's a you know there's a lot to consider in these situations to ensure that that type of combination effectively unlocks value for stakeholder stakeholders, uh, and because of that, the like the transaction paper is often more detailed. There you'll see things like reciprocal representations and interim operational covenants for both parties, as well as sort of details around um, expansive governance. You know how everything's going to fit together um, and compensation details. Uh, Brad mentioned Kirkland Ray Lake and uh, Gold and Ignico um, in 2022, which is one that we've worked on and we're quite proud of how that one's turning out. A really unsuccessful example is Dahmer Chrysler, where you know it basically fell apart after a period of time. Excellent. And, and I think the, the point on, on shareholder communication um, is a very good one, Sarah, because um, it's, it's a lot easier uh, when you talk about premium and numbers, because numbers speak for themselves. It's a lot harder than selling a story uh, on, on, on the rationale and so forth. So, so uh, th that's, that, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I think, look, I, we, t we touched on this a little earlier in this discussion as well, but the, you know, but from a financial perspective, I think the target board, you know, with help of its, you know, financial advisors is looking at the potential re-rate of the shares of the combined company. They're, they're assuming that the, that the multiple, the like multiples of the combined company are going to increase because of the various strategic, um, you know, factors at play and, and the strategic rationale for the transaction. And so, I mean, it, look, it is a difficult, difficult decision for a target board to make when they're looking, when they're, you know, if they're in a situation where they're weighing a, you know, a premium deal, there's a premium deal on the table, and there's an offer on the table that they could pursue versus a uh, zero premium or low premium transaction. And you're, you're, you know, sort of, uh, you know, you know, trying to anticipate what the uh, re-rate is going to be in the future versus the premium being offered to you now. So, I mean, I think, Look, I, I I can completely understand why the target board would pursue uh, a low or zero you know zero premium or low premium deal over a um, higher premium deal, but it but it is a it is a difficult situation to be in. There's no doubt about that. Excellent. And so I, I guess notwithstanding that, though, we still see a lot of premium deals. Um, now, now, Brad, Brad, let me ask you this. So if in situations where, you know, you have a premium deal, you have an acquirer offering its paper and its consideration, and often we see uh, the acquirer's shares uh, decline after there's the announcement, right? And so that implied premium uh, often gets eroded and sometimes quite quickly. Um, is that, sorry, a concern when you're trying to, sell the deal to shareholders? I think it's a real concern. It, it may be the biggest concern 
um, from a marketing perspective, right? And and we've, we have seen this, uh, especially in the gold space, but I'm sure it's not limited to that, right? And, and you know, partly that is a function of, you know, the, like maybe one of the first, if not the first, at least in recent memory, no premium deal was the Barrick Rangel deal. And since then, uh, you know, Mark Bristow has been very critical uh, of high premium deals. So like, I think I, when you're announcing a transaction um, that that has a, you know, a significant premium attached to it, uh, I think there is, there is definite concern uh, that there could be uh, an erosion of the share price uh, right away or a decline in the share price right away. I mean, it's commonly referred to as the settle. It's, you know, the bankers try to predict what the settle is likely to be, and it's a function of, you know, the, the dilution, um, you know, whether the transaction was, you know, dilutive to, to shareholders on a short-term basis, but it's really, it's really hard to predict. Um, and it really does put the deal in jeopardy, right? Because you now have the value of the consideration significantly uh, uh, weakened. And so the target shareholders may not uh, approve the transaction if they feel like the, the fair value uh, or uh, of the target is greater than the value of the consideration post announcement. Um, it increases interloper risk because now you know again you're you're as an interloper or a competing bidder you you can base you know your offer on the current value uh, of the acquirers. Uh, offer right you, you would and you can say our our competing bid is at a premium to the current value of the deal on the table as opposed to the value uh, of, of the uh, of the deal prior to announcement and if the acquirer needs its own share of approval obviously having its share price decline uh, immediately post announcement is highly problematic because you could have shareholders say I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, notwithstanding the strategic rationale, I'm going to vote the deal down on the acquirer side uh, in the hopes that the share price would rebound if the deal wasn't completed. So I, I think this is a, an, an, you know, an absolute critical issue for the parties to, to uh, take into account uh, as they're negotiating price. This, this may be yet another one of those circumstances of be careful what you wish for. And if you're on the, if you're on the target side and you push things too far, you may find that there, you know, you get a deal, but it won't, you can't be completed. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, in turn of, you know, to mitigate the risk, uh, very hard to do, but it's it's critical that the parties are ready to explain the the, the benefits of the transaction and market the transaction immediately, uh, you know, following announcement um, before, you know, there's any sort of misconceptions in the market or. Or, or, or views are formed. Excellent. And 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 uh, one uh, in that vein, um, one question, and, and this question actually came from one of the participants, which uh, leads me to say that uh, you're encouraged to submit any questions um, online uh, right now, and and uh, we'll have uh, a few minutes at the end to to address uh, your questions as well. But this question, and Neil, and I'll ask you, came directly from a participant today, and uh, and that is so often you see a conflict, right, between uh, from sort of a shareholder of an acquirer between long term returns um, and you know immediate uh, shareholder value. Uh, sorry, immediate shareholder returns. So uh, these two concepts often can be a conflict with one another. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. I feel that you know Brad did a really good job of kind of explaining the context in a merger of equals, and you know, may, or low no premium deal or low premium deal might not be that different in, in general. Um, and I, I think part of it is that uh, with the democratization of shareholding. Um, these days, it's just a really important factor to be able to have significant confidence in the transaction, what it means if you're on the acquirer side, because you have to do as good a job selling it to your own shareholders, um, to you know, as you might to the target shareholders or uh, the other party to the transaction. So, um, you know, institutional shareholders play a much, much bigger role and activists uh, play a much, much bigger role. Um, you know, some people, you know, use the expression that, uh, 
M and A's and new activism. So, you know, what the a company might be doing um, might be driven by uh, a shareholder base. It might be an activist uh, saying you should do these types of deals, or it might be an activist or something a shareholder saying do not do these types of deals. So, um, it's much more acute. Certainly, you know, I've been doing this for a long time than when I started practicing. Uh, you know, on the acquirer side, you know, it was a good transaction. It was a creative. Uh, you know, you're going to go ahead, and uh, I think people properly uh, spend more time thinking about, you know, what it means to the shareholders, how they how they might react. The balance between the two uh, two things that you just mentioned uh, is an important one. So um, I think there the difference if you go back X years is that there are more external forces, um, whether it's your own shareholder base or regulators or you know, your ISS and Glass Lewis of the world, you have to do a lot more thinking about um, what it means on the acquirer's side as well. So I don't know if others have thoughts on that, but uh, definitely more of a microscope on that issue. And just shareholders having much more uh, say than they used to and boards paying more attention to the shareholder base than they used to. If you go back, you know, X, you know, X years ago, probably you know, decades ago, more than years ago, but um, certainly seen that evolve over time. Excellent. So, uh, so that will uh, that will complete that sort of discussion on on uh, on the theme, and and the last theme that we'll touch on is certainly one of my favorites, and and that's friendly and hostile situations. And so, um, uh, let me get a little bit back to basics, and and perhaps Brad, I'll ask you this. Um, what is a hostile bid uh, and how common are they in the mining space? Yeah, so, you know, a, a hostile bid is simply uh, a takeover bid um, that, you know, which is an offer made directly to the shareholders uh, that is not supported by the target board. You could, you could have a takeover bid uh, that is supported, um, but that would just be, that would be a friendly takeover. The hostile takeover is when, um, you know, as I say, the target is not prepared to recommend in favor, uh, at least initially, uh, um, you know, of, of the offer being made. Hostile bids are very rare, um, especially since the takeover bid regime changed uh, in Canada in 2016. Um, there's been 17 hostile bids uh, in the last six years, only five of which have been uh, in the mining space. Um, you know, it, it's it's probably a function of uh, the new rules. I mean, the new rules were designed to rebalance uh, the dynamics between uh, uh, bidders and target boards. I think the, the Securities Commissions felt like uh, you know, the playing field was tilted too much in favor of offerers. Um, and so, you know, part, you know, what they did uh, in part was ex um, extend the minimum deposit period from 35 days to 105 days. And that is no doubt a long time for an offeror to have a bid out in the market, uh, especially, especially if, if share consideration forms a part or all of the consideration. Um, there's also a 50% minimum tender condition. Uh, it's a statutory minimum tender condition cannot be waived where 50% of, of the issue notes standing shares have to be tendered to the bid. And a, uh, there's a mandatory 10 day extension. If 50% if or more are tendered and uh, there's an obligation to take up, there's an obligation on the offeror to extend, uh, which is designed to reduce uh, you know, the course of effect that, that bids used to have. So you, you put it all together and I think structurally um, it's harder on offerors uh, to make bids work. But, I, but I, I'm not sure quite, quite frankly, if, if that's the whole story. I, I think that there is, you know, a negative connotation to being seen to go hostile. You know, and, and, you know, the mining industry, notwithstanding that it's, you know, the largest, uh, you know, one of the largest sectors in, in Canada, in, you know, in the, in the public uh, capital markets, it's still small and people know each other. And having the reputation of going hostile, I think, 
I think companies are concerned that that might negatively impact their ability to do friendly deals uh, uh, in the future. So I, I just think there's, you know, it's been relatively few uh, hostile bids made for that reason. Excellent. And so I, I suppose I'll ask, uh, Sarah, I'll ask you this, when you're faced with a hostile bid, what are some of the defensive tactics that a target company can do? What do you do? Um, well, there's lot, there's lots, <laughs> um, but the one, the ones that the most common that we see, um, I can talk about a few of them. Um, so looking for a white knight, um, and a white knight is, is kind of obvious in the name. It's, it's a second bidder to come in and, and make a superior proposal. Uh, and then the target will enter into a support agreement with them. A really, um, a, a strong example of that that we've seen in the news was Pembina when Pembina did a white knight offer for inner pipeline against Brookfield who was a significant shareholder in inner pipeline, inner pipeline and who had launched a hostile bid. So that, that's one. Um, white knights you know, can be subject to scrutiny. Um, they can be justified where they induce a competing bid and the competing bid represents uh, better value for shareholders. And there's a good commercial balance between the potential negative effect as auction inhibitors and the potential positive effect as auction stimulators. You know, we always say to our directors and officers, if you are going to look for a white knight, you have to be aware of your fiduciary duty to, that you owe the target company. Um, you can't recommend that shareholders reject a bid out of self-interest or to entrench a position with the, in the company. And I think as Brad touched on, hostile bids can become quite emotional because it just feels different, right? Like something friendly feels something you've agreed to, something you've collaborated on, whereas hostile is is hard. And and when we've had to act on them you see that it's it's very, very draining on your, your management team and your board, and you have to caution against people acting out of self-interest. Another option is uh, selling crown jewels. Um, and the crown jewel defense is when the target company of a hostile takeover bid sells one of their key assets or some of their key assets to reduce the attractiveness to the hostile bidder. Issue with those is that those can change the entire nature of a company, leave it with a different set of sales and earnings growth prospects. Um, and then there's potentially a decrease in brand equity value and shareholder support. Um, but we, ha we have seen those used, but very infrequently. Another one is a friendly private placement, which is simply um, meant to, you announce a private placement and it's simply meant to reduce the, um, to dilute rather the existing shareholders. Uh, one that was in the news a while ago was back in 2016, there was an insider bid by Hecla Mining for Dolly Varden Silver Corporation. And there's been a lot of commentary on that and a lot of commentary from the commissions on that. And the securities commissions won't intervene on a private placement if it, if it serves a valid corporate objective. but you have to be able to defend the legitimacy of the private placement um, because it, it serves a clear actual financing need. Then the last most obvious one is shareholder rights plans. The mechanics of those rights plans are quite complex and I'm not proposing to get into them now, but the key purpose of a rights plan is to provide a target board with time to consider alternatives to a hostile bid. With that said, a lot of the utility of those plans um, in the context of hostile bids has diminished markedly when we overhauled the Canadian takeover bid regime back in 2016. Yeah, so I guess on that note, yeah, you know, rights plans, the, the way that the system used to work is, uh, you know, the minimum bid period was 35 days. And it was it was customary for, you know, a, a target of a hostile bid to immediately put in place a rights plan um, that would last uh, until it was ceased traded by the by the regulators. Now, you know, you could have you could have a rights plan in force, a uh, strategic plan in place, or adopt a tactical plan. Um, you know, but there, you know, at least at least the strategic plan is likely to have a permitted bid concept, which basically means that the hostile bid is made in compliance with takeover bid rules. Uh, you know, you know, so namely it has, you know, a minimum bid period of 105 days. So the, the, the primary purpose of rice plans, uh, has definitely changed, right? It's, it's, it's now no longer about, uh, extending the time frame. I mean, I think you could try to have a rice plan in place to extend the bid period beyond 105 days, but I, I think you would have to have, um, you know, very special circumstances for a regulator to allow that. 
so now really, you know, the purpose of the rice plan is to prevent creeping beds. That's the, that's the term of art, which effectively means uh, a, 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 an offer or acquiring shares beyond the 20% threshold, which is what triggers a takeover bid through an exemption from the formal bid rules. Um, you know, that could be a private agreement exemption or, of course, purchase exemption, uh, a purchase of uh, shares from a non-Canadian, uh, may, you know, uh, you know, at least technically it is not, would not trigger a bid, although under public interest rules, the commissions may very well step in there. Or the second main purpose of the rights plan now is uh, to prevent hard lockups. So that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, a, you know, a rights plan, um, the new generation rights plans, uh, you know, preserve this notion that it would trigger the rights plan if the offer or entered into a hard or irrevocable lockup with a with a shareholder. And so that those are serial, the, the two primary purposes. But you know, like I'm, I'm curious about my pan, you know, from my fellow panelists, like how often do you see companies adopting these what are now limited utility rights plans uh, and is there a difference between adopting them you know re just having the shareholders reapprove a rights plan that's you know been in place for a while now versus adopting one uh sort of out of the blue um you know because i i have heard that people are concerned about sort of the signaling effect uh, of adopting a rights plan that, you know, it sort of signals that, you know, you may be the target of a, of a bid. So what, what has your experience been on that front? We're definitely, no, think, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Neil. I already talked. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, no, I, I think that in the past, you know, it would be very normal to have a rights plan. You put it in place, no one would think anything of it because of the reasons you, you know, that you described, um, the, the very purpose of rights plan used to be just to buy yourself time to find a white knight, the process that Sarah described, see if there's a better deal out there. And the regulator has effectively said, well, I'm, now I'm giving you 105 days, board. You have 105 days to, to go find a better deal. So, um, you know, it might be a bit of signaling if you adopt one now. Um, certainly the ones that we're seeing are just, you know, the compliant ones, uh, um, the ones that, you know, are that the ISS and Glass Lewis, the proxy advisors, will get and say, you know, that's 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 fine, has a permitted bid concept. But uh, I don't think you see as many people running to market to just put them in place uh, for no reason, whereas in the, in the past you did. Uh, and what you have to understand, the dynamic used to be, it was great for lawyers, frankly, um, because everyone had a little bit of a, it was almost a play where everyone, you know, said their part. So if the target, you said, well, I need the rights plan, to allow myself enough time to get a better bid. And then the acquirer would say, there's no other buyer. Uh, this is smoke and mirrors. They don't need any more time. And at some point the regulator would say, as the expression went, it's time for the bid, for the, for the pill to go. So it's time for the poison pill to go. And there's just that time is now built into the regulatory regime. So I think it is less common and I guess a little more suspect for lack of a better term to, to see people putting in place. There's still some utility for the reasons that Brad described. I would echo Neil's comments. The only time I'm usually seeing them now, unless it's in a hostile situation, which isn't that common, is where you're just putting in sort of the ordinary course ones, um, you know, flying below the radar on, on them and knowing that there'll be, you know, ISS and Glass Lewis aren't going to have an issue with them. And, and, and that's the only time really now. People don't seem to be putting them in just willy nilly and for the reasons that have already been articulated. Excellent. Um, and, and so, and, and I was going to mention, so this shareholder rights plans and, and, and or also known as, as poison pills, um, we do see them quite often as well, perhaps south of the border in the United States. Um, especially, I, I believe it was in the in the case of Twitter. I think they they constituted a, a poison pill at the time. So um, you know, I, I think with our friends south of the border, we probably see it more often, and and uh, than we do here in Canada. Um, and and perhaps why don't we switch gears a little bit now? You know, over the course of I think twenty twenty two. Um, there were a number of com companies on the news, uh, that being uh, Canadian Pacific Railway, um, Kansas Southern, 
um, and um, Canadian Pacific Railway. So I understand we also had some involvement uh, acting for a fund. Uh, so Neil, let me direct the question to you. Uh, what was that all about and uh, what did we learn? Sure, uh, very interesting situation. So uh, Brad and I acted for TCI, which is a UK uh, fund in connection with its uh, holdings and you know, call it activism campaign with respect to CN. Um, a good example of what I mentioned before in terms of um, shareholders and their input on what a company is or is not doing. So um, TCI had, you know, this is uh, all very public because there was a, a public proxy fight which uh, ended up, spoiler alert, being you know settled at the end. Um, but um, you know, TCI didn't like the Kansas uh, City deal from CN's perspective. Uh, that was one of their issues. They had other issues which they had voiced uh, previously. Um, you know, uh, an activist who had a significant holding in CN and also had holdings in, in Canadian Pacific as well. Um, had sort of a public uh, disagreement after kind of private discussions with the company uh, and went out. Uh, we, we had a, a proxy fight set up on a, a special meeting. Um, you know, it was a disagreement on the fundamentals of the of the Kansas City deal. This takes us full circle back to the break fee discussion because TCI very publicly said the deal made no sense for CN. And one of CN's reactions was, well, we're getting a really good break fee out of it. Um, so TCI was you know, use the typical refrain, well, you don't do deals to get a break fee. So the fact that you're trumpeting that you're getting a break fee out of doing a deal that's not good for the company gives us, you know, cold comfort. And they had some issues with the way the company was being run uh, itself and its strategic plan. Um, it's all pay played out, you know, rather publicly. Um, TCI made its views known as to how the company was being run. CN put out a strategic plan which was backed by the CEO. Um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, the CEO of CN uh, announced that he was retiring early uh, in the context of the, of the proxy fight. And there were um, board seats that were given to the activist uh, uh, shareholder group, I would say, or the I would say the shareholder group in general, because TCI was a you know pretty loud activist, but there was a significant shareholder base. Um, all this is public as well. Um, so um, the Gates Family Foundation, for example, is a, a, a significant shareholder. It all ended in a, uh, a settlement, but a really kind of classical example, I'd say, of shareholder activism in the sense that, you know, private discussions that it, uh, activists didn't get what it wanted, got quite public about it. Um, there was a, some agreement as to when the shareholders meeting would take place. We requisitioned a special shareholders meeting, uh, ended up, you know, getting resolved in a settlement, which um, Brad probably knows the stats much better than I do in terms of how many activist situations get resolved as opposed to a final proxy fight. But it all kind of funneled to that. Uh, I mean, ultimately, if you're the company, you see the writings on the wall, you're not going to win. Um, you know, often you'll say, we'll hear some board seats and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll consider some of the points that you raised. So, oh, Brad, if you wanted to, to add to that, it was a certainly interesting story that went on for I think a better part of the year. Yeah, no, it was it was a it was a fantastic situation um, for us to be involved in. Um, you know, our, our you know got lots of experience on the activism front. Seemingly, uh, this this niche in railroad activism because we acted for Canadian Pacific back in 2012, uh, defending them against Pershing Square, and then you know fast forward, we're now acting for TCI targeting CN Rail. Um, CN Rail was, you know, uh, I think the largest uh, company, Canadian company to be targeted by activism. So great deal to be involved in. I think, you know, at a very high level, like the, the, the biggest difference between the, those two activist matters, you know, and they were separated by about 10 years is, is the speed in which CN Rail responded. And they're not, they're not alone to that. That's, that's just what companies do now, right? You know, as soon as we requisitioned meeting, I think it was four days later, they had announced their 2022 strategic plan. Like they were ready, they were ready to go. And then they, you know, I, I suspect that they, you know, was talking to their larger shareholders and must have received some feedback because 
shortly after that, it was announced that their CEO was going to be resigning, you know, by the end of January, right? And they form a search committee to find a new CEO. Very, very different scenario to, uh, you know, the, the way that people used to approach these things where they would, you know, they would, you know, try to fend off the activists um, uh, and, it, you know, maybe all the way up to the meeting. Uh, this, you know, this was a case where CN Rail, uh, you know, made some changes very quickly in an attempt to sort of take the wind out of our sails uh, and, and leave us with, you know, less things to complain about because they they made the changes. And ultimately it created, I think, room to settle, um, you know, prior to actually going to a vote. Uh, so that's, I think that's one of the biggest takeaway, uh, you know, um, in terms of activism now, that if you're the target of an activism, I mean, it's a real threat. Uh, and, you know, you should be prepared to take action quickly uh, to to deal with this situation, um, you know, if it's if it makes sense to do so. Yeah, and I think it's a very good point that Brad makes. The way that activism has changed over the years, if you're acting for an activist, you shouldn't assume that you're going to catch a target company flat-footed because if they're doing their job properly, um, you should, if you're on the board, you should look at the soft spots of your own company and your own vulnerabilities and address them from a substantive perspective and understand what an activist might say. And I think that's something that you've seen change kind of gradually over the years because you're not doing your job if you if you don't do that as a board member. Um, not to just be defensive, but to understand what you could be doing better because targets of activism are not only companies that are doing poorly, it's companies that could be doing better and the activists will find the ways in which you could be doing better. So a lot has changed. I like to you know, talk to clients about activism on the defense side and we do as much defense work probably you know more than activist work is um, if you use an iceberg analogy to activism. So first of all, what you see is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. What's really going on is a lot is you know, under the surface. And then the other reason you can make the iceberg analogy, you know, again, to to refer to the Titanic is kind of once you see the iceberg, you yell iceberg, it's too late. So if you don't see the activists coming or the reasons why an activist might come, then you're in a poor position and a well-run company will, you know, will not be caught flat-footed. It'll be ready to react quickly. And if you're not, frankly, you're not doing what you're, what you should be doing. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's that's something that's changed over the years as well, right? Like we now have had a number of defense mandates that, uh, you know, pre-existed any activists showing up, right? It's working with the board uh, to help them set up a plan. And there's no, there's no silver bullet to preventing an activist or defeating an activist. It's exactly what Neil's saying, which is you need to be prepared for an activist. And that, and, and one of the most critical things is, is doing that, honest self-assessment or vulnerability analysis, and then taking, you know, proactive steps to address issues or weaknesses before the activist even shows up. And so that, uh, you know, companies uh, are definitely, definitely doing that uh, more often these days than in the past. And when you're doing board advisory work, um, sort of separate from the activism, you'll talk to CEOs and chairs and they'll tell you that the activist component now is something that keeps them up at night. Um, not in the same, like it's, it's a new evolution in the way the market's driven. We're able to move fast, like everyone is able to move faster, react quicker, like whether it's the activists, whether it's the lawyers, the financial advisors, the company. And so you, you know, the sooner that you, you, you think about these things and as Brad says, you assess your vulnerabilities and even just like right down to a checklist, like what are you going to do when you get that first call? How are you going to react? Who are you going to speak to? Who's going to provide support to you? The granularity of it can be, you know, you can get right down into the weeds on it, but I think it does give boards and CEOs comfort when, when, you know, that iceberg is floating around and you just, you, you never know when you're going to hit it. That, 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 that's th those are excellent points in terms of taking taking for boards taking a proactive role and and sort of making sure that they are surrounding themselves with, with the expert advice uh, to be able to deal with those kind of situations. Um, so uh, let me just uh, skip a little bit and change gears. Um, so you know prior to commencing a takeover bid. Um, should an acquirer take a toehold position? So, so get some shares. 
Um, and uh, what is, are there any problems with there? Are, are there any disclosure obligations with that, Neil? So uh, mindful of the time, short answer, I mean, yes, you normally want to have a toehold uh, for various reasons, uh, depending on whether you're going friendly or hostile. Certainly, if you're going hostile, you want to have some shares in your pocket and, and, and say to the target, you know, we're, we hold X shares. Um, it's useful. Um, and then if there's an auction that's created by it, I guess you're kind of protecting your downside that if you don't, if you're not the winner, um, somebody else will come along at a higher price and um, it'll work out for you. Um, there are another a number of things to consider. Um, if you are connected with the company somehow, you have to be very careful about not having material non-public information. So um, if you're an existing shareholder, if a if you're a, sh a shareholder that is a nominee, you know, on the board, you have to be careful about flow of information. Make sure that when you do take a toehold uh, in the market and buy shares in the market, you're not doing something that you you should not be doing. Um, you know, in, in if it's a cross-listed issuer, you want to be careful about the thresholds on both sides of the border. So the U.S., you have to disclose holdings at five percent, and in Canada, it's uh, ten percent. And then you want to be careful about the pre-bid integration rules. And if you're you know not pay um, more than you're willing to pay in your in your bid circumstance, so there's a lot of things that go into it, and, and you know a good number of them are, are strategic. So uh, I probably leave it at that on the total front. Oh, that, that's excellent. And so I see here that uh, we're uh, running out of time. So I'll leave a little bit of time for questions from uh, from the participants. So uh, I'll just dive here into the uh, a question from one of the participants. Um, so uh, when there is an existing transaction in place, what is uh, what do you do? What is the process and, and how can the company respond? Perhaps I'll ask that to Brad, Neil, or Sarah, whoever wants to take that on. Oh, you're, you're referring to like a topping bid scenario. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So we've, you know, this, this goes back to the discussion about interlopers and competing bids and, um, you know, they, they're, we, they're relative, they're also relatively rare, probably not as rare as hostile bids, but, um, you know, we've had the, you know, the we've had the fortune to be involved in a number of circumstances involving talking bids, both on for the target, uh, on for the acquirer that's being talked, uh, and, and, you know, also, you know, acting for the person making the talking bid. Um, you know, if you're the, if you're the target and you receive a talking bid, that's not so bad, right? I'm thinking about one particular transaction flow that we did that, started off at a normal size premium that ultimately triggered a, an auction that that had several rounds and we ended up uh with a 425 percent premium it was tremendous um, cash and a cash deal so not not implied and, and yeah it went from shares to cash with a massive premium so you know the target was very happy that it was the recipient of a topping bid um of course like you do. It is a bit of a minefield, right? You need. You do need to be very careful when you're when you're dealing with a topping bid because you have an existing agreement in place, um, right? You have obligations to the acquirer that you that you uh, uh, need to be mindful of, right? And so, you know, they, with the, the typical structure is that you know the target has agreed to non-solicit provisions. Full stop. It's not going to go out there seeking a topping bid. But it can respond to a topping bid uh, that has been made for it, right? And and the, th the threshold for being able to engage in discussions or negotiations is, you know, relatively low. You know, you you, you receive an offer, and it doesn't. The offer that you receive doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to constitute or be a superior proposal right there. All the, all the typical formulation would be that it that it can you know. It would reasonably be expected to or lead to uh, a superior proposal, right? And that allows that initial offer to still, um, you know, be subject to diligence uh, and uh, negotiation of a definitive agreement. And so once the board has made their initial determination that this acquisition proposal uh, could lead to a superior proposal, then it can engage in discussions. It can also provide, it would be typical for the target to be able to provide confidential information 
to the competing bidder, uh, subject to entering into a new CA um, with that competing bidder. And at that point, the competing bidder and the target, uh, you know, the, the target can provide access to diligence materials and the, the two parties can negotiate the terms of definitive the agreement. If they're if they are able to settle, then the next step would be for the competing bidder to table a binding offer, uh, which will include a executed copy of the definitive agreement. If at that point the target determines that the binding offer constitutes a superior proposal, it's going to notify the existing acquirer, and that would trigger the right to match period, typically five days. If at the end of that period, the you know there's no match, um, then the target is free in a typical circumstance to pay a break fee, terminate the existing agreement, and enter into the new agreement with the competing bidder. So listen, that was really diving into the weeds, um, but you know you know I think the takeaway is you know it you know if you're the re- if recipient, you're the target, and you're the recipient of a bid, a competing bid. You can entertain it, but there there are steps that you need to take to ensure compliance. Because if you if you make a footfall, you could preclude yourself from accepting that bid. So it's it's critical that uh, obviously you work with your advisors to to navigate your way through that process. No, I, I think that's an excellent point, Brad. And 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 quite frankly, it is these agreements can get quite complicated. And but there's specific. Um, uh, territory in which a target and acquirer must walk, and so not to be able to trip on that, you got to make sure that you're you're getting uh, the right advice to make sure that uh, ultimately there's no pitfalls and the transaction uh, is successful. So I see that we have time for a couple more questions. Um, another question from the participant is, uh, how do you decide to go friendly or hostile? So maybe I'll ask uh, Sarah that. Sorry, having mute issues. Uh, <laughs> I mean, h- how do you decide, right? I-, I mean, I think we've touched on it already with the iceberg analogy and everything else. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that you don't know you're going to get a bid, whether it's friendly or hostile. So when it's friendly, obviously you've been talking about it or maybe talking about synergies and that kind of thing and and working through what what something might look like. Even when it's hostile, you you know you're you're probably going to get it. You've got you've got somebody who's raised issues. Um, you know, got significant institutional shareholders who are not happy with poor financial results and low share value. Um, when your financial results are lagging behind your peers, um, you know you get rumors in the market about a takeover target. So you know it's. I don't I, like I said, I don't think anyone is ever surprised when it when it happens. I think most people prefer to go the friendly route. Then that's just evidenced by the fact that, you know, the, the statistics on hostile, um, both from a success perspective, but also from a, um, you know, the, just the number that we see are low. I think sometimes you get um, activist shareholders who want changes in a company and they use a hostile situation as effectively a stick. And, you know, they they may know that there's no possibility that they're going to be successful, um, but, you know, they've been rebuffed. The board has refused to engage with them. There's tension. And, you know, really, they want a couple board seats or a commitment to change. And so they, they use it in that manner. So, you know, friendly is when you're actually maybe trying to get a deal done and hostile could could be either either way, whether you're just trying to get a result um, and that could be an t- actual takeover or whether it's trying to get some some change from your board and, and entrenched management team. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, most people don't want to go hostile or certainly immediately. There's not a real reason to do so, uh, but you want to be ready to do it if you think you might have to. So you'll make your approach and then you know, often, Sarah said, nobody's surprised, you'll often get what's called a bear hug letter before that happens. So it's really not as friendly as it sounds. It's your company's wonderful. We think it's great. Uh, uh, it would be great if you combine it with our company or we acquire it. It'd be great for your shareholders. Uh, we'd love to sit down with you. And the last paragraph says, and by the way, if you don't, we're going to go straight to your shareholders in the next 48 hours. So you're usually ready to do that. You don't do it on a lark. But you know whether you think you you might have to go hostile or not. So it'll at least start out as friendly. 
if not for the fact, if just for the fact that you want to appear to have tried with the target, right? Because you want to say, they forced my hand, I tried to go friendly, this is, you know, great for you shareholders, and, you know, their board wouldn't hear of it, so I they, they forced my hand, I have no choice. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I think... So, sorry, go ahead. I'm going to say uh, the only thing to add to that would be, you know, if you're if you go if you're in the acquirer and you're heading down the hostile route, you're you're effectively cutting yourself off from access to to diligence material or non-public information, um, you know, and and you know, oftentimes acquirers are sort of unwilling to transact without you know doing a due diligence review prior to to making an offer, uh, and of course, you're if you're going hostile, you're foregoing the support. From the board and you know you know that's that's actually quite a powerful thing especially with the if there's a retail shoulder base uh retail shoulders might you know look to their board um and, and follow the recommendation so it, it's I, I i think as sarah and neil said it's 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 definitely not uh the preferred route in in almost all circumstances for an acquirer but it's something that um and sometimes you need to be prepared to do excellent and, and I see that we're running out of time, but uh, I'll just take one more question because it's, it's a good one and maybe a quick response. Um, so we're seeing more, uh, or we've certainly seen some examples of uh, mini mergers and acquisitions where companies are doing M&A with their uh, streaming deals. So, so they're, they're streaming deals. And the participant is asking uh, whether, um, you know, as part of doing those M and A with streaming deals, whether that increases the exposure to activism. So this mini M and A's versus sort of large change of control transactions. I don't know if anybody wants to handle that one. I, I, I mean, yeah, I would just say again, it depends on the circumstances of the company, and if it makes sense for the company, and it's a there's a good strategic rationale. Then maybe not, but I think you know you are opening yourself up to uh, attack or criticism uh, if you're doing this, you know, uh, for other reasons or for reasons that aren't, you know, don't have a strong basis in your business and strategic uh, vision for the company. I would say uh, maybe it does open you up a little bit more. Sure. Excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Neil, Sarah, and Brad. Uh, this was excellent, very, very informative. And uh, it's, you know, these are big issues. We're talking about big and small companies and uh, um, whether it be from the target side or the acquirer side, uh, it's important to have sort of the, the experienced, uh, you know, steady-handed counsel to navigate them through this complex um, commercial realities. Uh, so that concludes our session today. Uh, and uh, I'm reminded by our uh, PDAC executive committee that we will be having another session tomorrow on March 3rd at noon, uh, which will be on the topic of climate litigation and greenwashing risks in the mining sector. Thank you so much to all the participants for attending. Uh, we were uh, happy to be with you today virtually.